Living History, World War II Stories is told by those who were there. And today we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of Corporal Harry Hutzel. Corporal Hutzel was a U.S. Marine Corps machine gun squad leader with the 5th Marine Division, seeing action on the island of Iwo Jima. This might be my time, because you thought a lot more about it when you went over the second time. You, you gave a lot more thought, and you became, uh, in the first two invasions, uh, safety and take care of yourself was very important, but it wasn't as important as it was the second time. Second time, you just became much more aware of what was going on around you and what could you do to help it. And I had a real good buddy, a guy named John J. McCarthy. He and I kind of teamed up. He had one a platoon, I had a, another platoon. and uh, He and I devised a thing where uh, we, li we lived out at Tent Camp One, which was about halfway to Laguna Beach from where Camp Pendleton was at Oceanside. And our idea was to take our two squads because all the guys were worried that we were going to leave and they weren't going to get their 30-day leave. So we thought, well, why don't we issue them some 30-day leaves? We'll just march out the front gate and just keep on going, you know, and just take a 30-day. And then we'll reassemble, see how good we are with our discipline, we'll reassemble at a certain bar in Laguna Beach 30 days from now, and we'll march back in. And that's exactly what happened. And when we marched back in, they marched us right straight down to the brig. <laughs> And Sergeant McCarthy and Corporal Hutzel, soon to be Sergeant Hutzel, became Private Hutzel. <laughs> but we were leaving within two weeks, and they were scared to death that, uh, you know, they had to get us out. I got my Corporal back, but I didn't get my Sergeant. Mac didn't get it. He got a Corporal, he didn't get a Sergeant, but we still took over the platoons. It didn't matter. Uh, we never got in, you know, it's like the sergeant on the first night we were there, fellas, there's several things we don't talk about. We don't talk about guys' girlfriends or wives. We don't talk about religion. And we damn sure don't talk about politics because none of you are smart enough to understand it. <laughs> and we were all 17, 18 years old. Who the hell's going to talk about politics? I don't give crap about politics. Can't vote for four years anyway. <laughs> yeah. But that was, uh, that uh, comradeship carried over. The best landing place was from right under the mountain here to about right in here. Uh, we came in, the first two waves came in and landed from here. A Company, B and C and D and E on the 28th all landed right in this area and our job was to go across and about halfway across uh, E Company, D, C and E Company would turn and head for the mountain. We would go over here and secure a line across here, and then A Company would go around the mountain and come up the back. My squad, uh, they wanted the, the machine guns up and halfway across the island sitting up quick. And so we were the first ones to get in this area and start across. Well, we had no more than probably, hadn't even got set up yet. It was maybe an hour just getting up this embankment. Uh, the third and fourth wave started coming in. And boy, they cut loose on that mountain like you can't believe it, which was the whole tactics. Get all those guys on the beach, and that beach was terrible. I mean, it was just unbelievably how bad it was. Uh, the first three or four days are just, that beach was brutal, just brutal. Until we got around and got up in E Company, and that's where the flag of our fathers yes, yes. Uh, comes in. When we came up the backside, uh, the little one was up. We didn't see it go up, it was up. But we saw the first one brought down, and then we were busy with our stuff and didn't pay attention, turn around, the big one was up. 21st day, uh, right, just about right where this V's in here, there's a great big shell hole made from, I assumed a bomb, it was so big, and I, I uh, led my group in there and we set up three machine guns so that we could fire down the runways. All of a sudden we had we had a semi bonsai charge come right straight at us. And uh, we just doubt expended all our ammunition. So I told three of the ammunition carriers, carried the boxes of, of machine gun equipment, uh, let's take off in three directions. Took off all at the same time. 
and they started down and ran down, ran up, and came out and just as they came out, all three of them. And uh, they just opened fire like crazy. And uh, they weren't killed, but they were clearly wounded. And so I said, well, it's, it's, it's my turn. I got to go. I can't just keep sending guys till I'm the only one left. So I zigzagged up and got up the top and took off. And I'm running. The guy said, dive. And I just dove in the air. I just, you know, what the hell, I'm going for this dugout that they've got there. And as I hit the air, the machine gun hit it and ripped up my heel and tore the muscle, the nerves out of the right leg. It got me on a stretcher. It took me back to the medical center and they uh, cut the shoe off and kind of bandaged that thing up. And then they got this bleeding stopped. And they said, you got any more problems? I said, uh, no, I no more problems. They said, well, that's a million dollar wound right there. You know, you're on the way home. And that was the 21st day, same day Bradley, the corpsman, got hit. And so they took us out and they put 20 of us on a C-40, I, I call it a C-47, I'm not really what it was, but it, yeah, whatever it was. We took off and as we went past Mount Suribachi on the takeoff, the pilot got shot. And this thing is going crazy and the, the uh, co-pilot's got to find them under control, brings us back and lands us and everybody, just get us off his plane, hey, eh? I don't want to be on this plane, can't you put us on a, and the hospital ship was there, so they took all of us, all off, and took us out to the hospital ship. I'm there and uh, on the second bunk and over here in the second bunk turns out to be Bradley, whom I didn't know, he was from our regiment, but I, he was in a different company. And we're out. The second day, we're about a half a day away from Guam. They came over and they said, two survivors of the flag raising of Iwo Jima, Ira Hayes, uh, Rennie Gagnon, um, are being flown back to Washington. And Bradley says to nobody, he said, well, I was, a, I was there, what the hell are they talking about? I'm alive. Um, I was in the hospital there oh, just short of a year. and. Uh, when I got on the crutches is when they they uh, came and said that I was the only guy in that naval hospital who'd been on Iwo, particularly at the time of the flag raising, and they were going to unveil the seventh war bond drive in Times Square, where 200,000 people gathered, and they were going to unveil this uh, statue, which was a uh, replica of the big one, and um, they wanted me to be on the stand uh, with the other three guys. And I said, well, I don't think I should be with the other three guys, but I'll be on the stand, that's fine. Well, it was the best break I ever had because Bradley and I were both on crutches. And he came in in the convertibles, looked up, looked at me and said, Guam. I said, you were. <laughs> And uh, he came up, and etc., and we chatted back and forth. Well, after it was all over, I was free to go, you know, wherever I wanted. Well, for the next three months, while I had the crutches, when they took those crutches away from me, I cried like a baby. Because I'd go into Jack Dempsey's bar at 43rd and Broadway, everybody stood at the bar, and then there were tables up on a couple of circles around. I'd walk in, and, and one of the guys that was his bouncers, which were all his sparring partners, would get a chair and put it up there, and I would, you know, uh, 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 <clears throat> and I'd look under my arm to see how many free drinks were already there. <laughs>